What will become of an alternate universe wherein the evil maker plots so that the heroes of the Marvel Universe are never born at all? Well, let's hop into the pages of Ultimate Invasion issue number two and find out together, shall we? So then, picking up directly from where the last issue had left off, the maker had abandoned Earth 616 for a brand new Earth designation 6160. He's been hard at work, but still the last words of Reed Richards ring in his ear, would you unmake me if you could? Would you erase me your most hated foe, and well, he really seems like the Maker has taken those words to heart. Obviously, we saw him at the end of the previous issue make sure that this world's Peter Parker was never bitten by a radioactive spider on that fateful day, and he hasn't stopped there either. He went to Asgard and made sure that Thor was humbled and that Loki sat on the throne. He even used his knowledge of future events in other universes to make sure that this Earth's Fantastic Four never actually got pelted by cosmic rays. Of course, this is an alternate Earth, which means there's going to be differences, there's going to be variances, and there's going to be things that you just kind of can't stop. The Stark Corporation still makes weapons of war, Bruce Banner is still in a gamma blast, and World War II assumedly still happened, only this time around there seems to be no Captain America frozen in the ice. It was perhaps for all those reasons and more that the Maker actually chose this Earth to start over and create a new universe in his image. In fact, he even harkens back to one of his old plans, wherein he trapped himself purposely in a time bubble, so that he could accelerate his own creation of amazing technology. He plans to do the same thing here on this Earth, but do so on a much grander scale. He even sets up shop in Latveria outside what is supposed to be Doctor Doom's old castle. No word on what exactly happened to this world's Victor Von Doom. Though we do learn in an appendix page many of the most prominent super characters from across the Marvel Universe are either dead under the control of the Maker or have yet to come to be. Then, of course, you have particularly strange cases like Iron Man. Oh, this world has an Iron Man, only here's the thing. It's not Tony Stark, it's actually his still-alive father, Howard. It's Howard who's the billionaire playboy philanthropist with a drinking problem. Tony exists in this world, too. He's just a lot younger and not Iron Man. In fact, Obadiah Stane, the man who will be the Iron Monger, is alive and well, and there's even a Jarvis in 6162. Only, instead of a stuffy British man, it's a a stuffy British woman. We learn that Howard Stark has actually managed to create some pretty damn amazing miracles in his time at the top. He's cured heart disease, 12 different types of cancer, and the world is a hell of a lot better for him sticking around. It's for all those reasons and more, though. Howard is a little apprehensive from having to step away from the lab and research and development by his best friend and business partner, Obadiah, because they say he's actually needed much more as the more celebrity-focused face of the company. We also learn that the political makeup of this world is a little bit different from the main Marvel Universe and even our own. Howard and the Starks aren't just amazing scientists and creators, they're also apparently seen as world leaders in their own right. And today of all days just so happens to be a very special day as Howard and Obadiah are going for a big old meeting of the minds, a sort of world leader summit held in Latveria by the Maker. This whole thing actually has a big old whiff of Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory about it. Apparently the doors to Latveria have been closed for years while the Maker continued his work, and now they're swinging open for the first time in forever. Now, who are some of the other delegates attending the meeting? Well, there's the Immortal Hulk, who in this world is actually a gray-skinned religious leader. Apparently, this Hulk has foregone the ways of rage and instead teaches about peace, compassion, and pacifism, a far cry from the ever-loving Hulk we know from other universes. Then there's the Harada Yoshida group, basically an alliance of two of Japan's most powerful and influential clans, made up of this world's answer to Silver Samurai and Sunfire, and because, hey, mutants are getting a lot of love across the board here, there's also the Rasputin family out of Russia, made up of Magic, Omega, Red, and Colossus. Now, when the Maker, the actual Man of the Hour himself, arrives on the scene, though, he doesn't get much time to talk to his guests, as it's at that very moment a portal opens up in the sky, and hundreds of very familiar-looking heroes end up pouring through the portal, looking for the Maker's head. At first, I thought to myself, oh, hey, are these guys from other universes? But the truth, as we'll discover, is actually a lot more interesting than just that. Most of the Maker's guests rise up to defend him and themselves, but Howard and Obadiah actively try and escape. Sadly, Howard actually took Obadiah's advice and didn't come with his own mini suit. Though, thankfully, Obadiah Stane didn't take his own device because he activates this world's version of what I can only assume is the Ironmonger costume. It's not enough to save his life, though. Obadiah fights bravely 
effectively for a little bit, but is ultimately brought down by the sea of costumed heroes washing over Lodveria. Howard will end up passing out in the chaos, and when he comes to, the Maker is looking over him. Obviously, Howard wants answers. Why did his friend have to die today? And the Maker is all too quick to give those answers. Apparently, all these costumed heroes who are after the Maker right now aren't from another universe, but actually from this world's future. In fact, they are clones sent back in time as some sort of elaborate suicide bomber plot to try and stop the Maker from doing, well, whatever he ends up doing in the future. Obviously, the Maker has too many plans for this universe to get brought down right now by some time travelers, so to get rid of that problem and also show Howard who's boss, the Maker gets his guards to round up anyone from this time period who shares even a shred of genetic material with these future clones, and then he executes them all, causing a chronal butterfly effect that sees the entire army sent back to kill him turn into goo in a matter of seconds. Howard is pretty understandably horrified about all of this, but at the same time, he can't look away. The Maker also seeks to imply that everything good that has happened to Howard in this universe, everything that he's managed to do to make this world a better place by curing disease and building wonders, the Maker says none of that would have been possible without him. And that if they're going to continue doing good things and stay the course, the Maker is going to need Howard's help right now. Because of that, he takes him deeper into his inner sanctum and shows him his holiest of holies, the Amortis device. Obviously, a very fun reference to Reed Richards' own connection to Amortis and Kang. Basically, this machine is the reason that the Maker was able to bend Earth-6160 to his will so quickly. He can move backwards and forwards in time without resistance. But clearly, his actions are pissing off the future if they're sending hit squads after him. The worst part is, is that the Maker doesn't really know why or how to stop it. Why, you might be asking? Well, get this. This isn't actually the first time the future has sent a hit squad after the Maker. The first time they did, they actually managed to shoot him in the head and do some serious damage. Not enough to kill the Maker, mind you, he's smart enough to keep all his important organs elsewhere. But the damage was sadly enough to mess with his brain, and now the Maker is second-guessing everything he does. He does, however, know one thing for sure, and that is this Amortis device wouldn't be possible without the help of Howard Stark. Which is why he's called Iron Man here now. Help him save the device and help him save this world as the comic comes to an end. And so that was Ultimate Invasion issue number two, everybody, and once again, Hickman does an excellent job swerving us. You think the story's going one way, but then it ends up going a complete other. I thought this would be another multiverse tale, but instead it's actually shaping up to be one about time travel, which honestly fits the maker pretty well given his history. It's also a pretty fun thing to realize too that even after the maker monkeyed around with this universe so much, Hero still ended up happening and they're still fighting him one way or another. We've also seen a lot of different takes over the year on Howard Stark. It's funny that, you know, so many writers seem so obsessed with Iron Man's dad, but this is definitely a different take on him. He's accomplished so much, yet he's so equally conflicted. He has basically all the same demons that his son would have overcome by this age in his life, and you have to wonder, will that make him more pliable to the Maker's will, or will he ultimately end up overthrowing and fighting him? Let's just say I'm intrigued, and that no one does comic intrigue quite like Hickman does, so I'm most definitely excited to see what comes next. Overall, I would give this one another very positive 8 out of 10. Hey there everyone, it's your old pal Cape Jewel again, thanking you so much for watching to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, why not check out my Amazon link down in the description. Yes, that's right, the Cape Jewel channel officially has its own Amazon storefront now. You can pick up a comic or anything else for that matter, and if you did, you'd really be helping me in the channel. So with that out of the way everyone, I will see you again next time, Bye bye